Lord, we look to these heroes of the faith. And just reading that, I'm inspired. Just reading that, I'm, I'm, I'm challenged. Just reading that, Lord, I look at my life and I say, I, I need more faith. Lord, I want you to do great and mighty things through the things that I am involved in. And so, Lord, I pray that you, you would fill us with faith. That you would fill us with this kind of faith to move mountains, to take risks, to see something that is formless and voidless and watch you make it something. Watch, you, watch it take shape right in front of us. So Lord, I pray that as we get into this word this morning, I pray that you would fill us with faith. Lord, I pray that there would be, this room would be filled with peace, that no matter what's going on in our life, no matter what our week was or what it's going to be, that we would be right here in this moment and you would fill us with your peace right now, that the joy of the Lord would be our strength and that you would fill us with love. Lord, we're thankful for this time to come together and get into the Word. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week I was going to a meeting and I needed a book to go to the meeting with. And so I packed the car and I get the kids in the car and I get all ready and I get like, I had like eight different things to take and I got all seven things in the car and I forgot the book. I had to go back and, and get the book and we've all been there, right? I remember one time we were um, driving down to Florida with my parents and, uh, and we got halfway down the road and we got to the stop sign down the road and, and my dad said, oh, you know, shoot. And, uh, and he's like, I forgot the trip tick. Anybody know what a trip tick is? I used to write those. <laughs> you used to write those at AAA. So trip ticks are basically maps. Now you guys probably don't even know what maps are. <laughs> And so we had to turn around and we had to go back and get a trip, a tick, a, the trip tick. Because when you go on a trip, there's certain things on the journey that you want to have because you need it. You need it to make the journey. You got to have the map. You got to have the trip tick. Right nowadays, you know, I, you, you don't leave the driveway without, you know, without the address that you can plug into your maps. I was talking to somebody the other day and, and, they, and I, I told them that I was down in some part of the part of the country and they're like oh were you, oh it was it was lake george his parents were from lake george and he was asking me oh you know was it on this road where'd you go was it around here and i said i don't know i just put the address in my maps and go i don't know where i am half the time exactly just tell me where i'm going <laughs> exactly so you can't go on a trip without certain things right I mean, now you guys having this new baby, you can't leave the house without certain things. You're screwed. You have to go back. And it's the same way in our spiritual life. It's the same way in our journey with God. You can't go on a journey with God unless you have certain things, right? And I've found, though, that when you go on a journey, you know, God's directions, they're a little bit different than the directions on our Maps app. It isn't so specific. You can't swipe down on the screen and see every turn and how long it's going to take before you make your next turn and how long exactly it's going to take before you get there. One of the things my kids drive me nuts about is they don't ask me anymore how long it's going to be till we get there. They ask me to turn my phone on so they can see, oh, there's 18 more miles and we have 13 more minutes to drive and we're going to arrive at exactly 7.52. And it drives me crazy. It almost makes me want to turn my phone off and not use the app. But I need the app. And we like to know exactly where we're going to end up, exactly when it's, we're supposed to turn, exactly when we're supposed to do something, exactly how long it's going to take, exactly what it's going to look like. We like to know if there's going to be a Tim Hortons on the way or a place to stop to go to the bathroom. We like to know all those things when we take a regular trip, but we also like to know those things when we take a trip of faith. And God's directions are a little bit different. The only thing that God requires when we go on a trip with God is one thing. And that's the thing that was mentioned a ton of times in this chapter, the word faith. 
And even in this chapter, the famous verse, it is impossible to please God without faith. So before we go on any further into what we're doing here as a church, I feel like we need to learn about faith. We need to learn about the heroes of the faith and the journeys that they took. And what can we glean from them? What can we learn from them? How can we strengthen our faith and learn to see things God's way? And that's what the first three verses of Hebrews 11 are all about, is seeing through, seeing life and seeing the journey that we're on through God's way. And that first sentence gets my attention. Faith is confidence in what we hope for. It's, it gets my attention because... When I was young, I knew exactly what I was called to. I just, for some reason, I just knew that I was called to be in pastoral ministry from a very young age. It's something that stayed with me. I tried to run from it in so many different ways, but I just knew that it's what I was called for. I knew what I, what I was called to. Uh, I was called to be a pastor, to be in ministry, to lead people. But if you told me back when I was young that on October 8th 2023 when I was 43 that like everything that's happened in my life up until this point if you told me that that's how it was going to play out I would not have had any desire for it (laughs) right and it's the same way with you guys it's the same way with all of us if 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 we knew how hard the journey would be for life if you knew how difficult that your job would be, your career path, how difficult it would be with family things. If you knew exactly how difficult even your faith walk would be. If you knew how distraught and discouraged, frustrated with God, frustrated with other people, if you knew all of those things from the very beginning, how many of you would have ran from it? And I see things in terms of pictures. So when I was young, and even when I was in Bible college, I had this glamorized, sterilized picture of what ministry would look like in my head. I had this picture of what I desired. And this verse, it, ca- it catches me because it says, faith is the confidence in what we hope for. But I can tell you this, there are very few things in life that have happened the way that I hoped for them. And so why is faith the confidence in things we hope for? When half the time, more than half, I would say 90% of the time, the things that I hope for don't really happen. And God does it a completely different way. Now he does it better. And it's perfect. And it ends up being good for me. But it isn't the things I hope for. And then you look at the people in the Bible. Like you look at Moses. Moses probably didn't hope to be sent in a basket and pushed down the river to be, you know, possibly eaten by crocodiles and not be raised by his family. Noah probably didn't hope for being jeered for building a boat because it had never rained. He probably didn't hope to see the entire world's population killed. He probably didn't hope to live on an ark for hundreds of days. Abraham probably didn't hope that one day God would tell him to kill his son. But what did they hope for? So if if faith is the confidence in things that we hope for, what did Noah and Abraham and Moses and David and Samuel, what did they hope for? They hoped for the end result. And when I hope, when I put my faith in God, I'm hoping for the end result. One of the first times I ever traveled by myself, at, you know, as like a teenager, a young teenager, I went, um, I went to Alabama with Victory Christian Academy. And we did, we did like some drama down there. And we did a, um, we did like some nights that you know for the community and it was kind of a commissions trip 
So this was the first time I'd ever traveled outside of Buffalo on my own. And um, now you guys probably know my dilemma, but when I, when I got down to Alabama, we went out to a restaurant for one of the nights to eat, and on the menu was chicken wings. And this was back in the 90s when the only good chicken wings you could ever find anywhere in, were in Buffalo, New York. So I didn't realize how spoiled I was. So I saw chicken wings on the menu, and I knew I liked chicken wings in Buffalo, but I ordered them in Alabama, and they were not chicken wings in Alabama. I don't know what they were. It was, I was angry that they even called them chicken wings. But what I ordered and what I hoped for, my experience was completely different than what actually happened. Right? And that's what life is all about. So you cannot, you cannot hope for what you have right now. You cannot hope for what you think is going to happen. You can only hope for the end result. Noah was confident in God, not because he hoped to see everyone around him die. He was confident in God because he knew God would save him when this thing called rain came. Abraham was confident that a nation would be birthed from him. Joseph was confident his bones would be carried to the promised land and buried there. Moses was confident God had more for his people than just to be slaves. Now, Moses didn't have confidence in every step of the way. He didn't have a desire to be, uh, you know, in the wilderness for 40 years. He didn't have a desire that people would, that a million people would hate him on a daily basis and blame him for all their troubles and all their sorrows. That's not what Moses was confident in hope for, but he was confident in the end result that God would take them to the promised land. And so when we're, when we're confident in what we hope for, it's not, you can't have confidence in what you hope for, you have confidence in the end result and the promises that God has given us. It's the end result. It's the end of it. That's what we have confident hope for. The second part of the definition of faith in the first verse is assurance about what we do not see. It says faith is confidence, assurance of what we hope for, and or confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Then verse 3, which is where we're going to kind of park for the rest of our time this morning. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen... Now this is really an interesting verse. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. The assurance of what we do not see. The earth that God created was not a replica. He didn't look at earth version 1.0 and replicate it. Right? A couple of months ago, my father-in-law, he loves to garden. And so he wanted to um, give his daughter, Elaine a part of a plant so that she could take this part of the plant and plant it in her garden and then she would have the plant and he would have the plant. And so sometimes you can cut like a part of the plant off or a part of the root of a plant off and you can give it to somebody and then they'll be able to take that and and put it in the ground and it'll grow. That's not how the earth was made either. The earth wasn't taken from something that was already made. The earth was formed and forged by faith. Now, if God is faith, it was spoken into existence, the Bible says. And I think that some of the things that we struggle with when it comes to faith is we try to sometimes replicate faith that we see in other people. We try to recreate a faith that we see that someone else has. And you try to duplicate it. You see uh, someone in the Bible, or you see a pastor, or you see another friend in the faith, or you see someone in history that had great faith. And a lot of times what we try to do is we try to replicate or duplicate or copy another faith that we see. But the Bible says that God took the earth and he formed what is seen out of what was not visible. 
The other thing that we sometimes try to do with faith is we try to take someone else's, like a piece of someone else's faith, and we try to take a part of someone else's faith and implant it into ourselves, and we try to, like, take, like, little bits and pieces from all these different places and create this Christian walk out of something that we just kind of steal bits and pieces from other people. And that's not faith either. That's just being a copycat. And you're not going to see results if you try to either replicate, duplicate, or steal someone else's faith. You're not going to get anywhere in life by taking what I uh, exude as faith or the way that I walk by faith. If you try to just mirror what I do, you're not going to get anywhere with your faith. It's not going to create anything in your life. It's going to cause frustration and anger. And you're going to get angry at God because you're going to say, God, why isn't this faith working for me when it works for that person? And you're going to blame God for a faith that doesn't come from him. It comes from someone else. And so we walk by faith, not a faith that is visible. So if you try to take a faith that you see in someone else and replicate it in your own life, it's not coming from something that is invisible that is God. It's coming from something that's visible that will bear no fruit in your own life. You cannot take my roots of faith and copy exactly what I do and and it's going to produce anything in your life. God did not take the earth and replicate the earth. It literally came from something that was invisible. The earth... and I want to go to Genesis 1. And end there. Because Genesis 1 is what the verse in Hebrew references. And I want to point out two words here that I think can kind of describe sometimes our struggles. So if you look at Genesis 1, it says, In the beginning, and this is exactly what Hebrews 11.3 is talking about. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. And it says, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. He says the earth was formless and empty. Formless and empty. And darkness hovered over the deep. I have, there have been times in my life, and maybe you too, where I've looked at my life, I've looked at my circumstances, I've looked at where I'm at in life, and it has seemed formless. Now let me give you some synonyms of that word formless. Hazy. You ever look at your life and things just seem Hazy. Without shape, obscure. You ever look at your future and it seems obscure? Like, God, what are you doing? Where are you taking me? What are you doing? Here's another one, indefinite. You've ever had a problem, something going on in life, and it just, the, the end of it seems indefinite? It seems like it's going to go on forever? Those are synonyms for formless. We all get in this place in life where life seems like it's formless. Like it's hazy, obscure, and indefinite. Then the next word is empty. Let me give you some synonyms for that word, empty. How about void? (laughs) We've all felt void in our life. Ineffective. God, why is my life so ineffective? Why aren't you doing the same thing in my life that you're doing in their life? Why is all my hard work, like Al talked about last week, feeling like toil and just not there? Here's another one, inoperative. God, why isn't this working? I've been praying and reading and doing everything you tell me to do, and it's just inoperative. It's not working. I've been trying to stop doing this. I've been trying to stop struggling with that. I've been trying to not do this. I've been trying to change my thinking. I've been trying to change my feeling. 
I've been trying to do this. And you've been trying and trying and trying, and it's just inoperative. And so when God took the earth, it seemed like it was empty, inoperative, ineffective, void. He said that it was hazy, without shape, obscure, and definite. This is the earth that God was looking at. In Jeremiah 4.23, it says, Behold, I looked at the earth, and it was formless and void. That's what he says in Jeremiah 4. God says, I looked at it. I saw it. And maybe in life, there's areas in your life, and especially like for me, it's, it's where we're at with this church. There's just areas where I look at it and think, things seem hazy and indefinite and obscure. So, and there's areas, other areas, that it feels like it's an operative. What I'm doing is ineffective. And God says, I looked at something that was inoperative, ineffective, hazy, obscure. I looked at it. And then verse two, 3 comes in Genesis 1, and it says, And God said. And God said. He looked at the earth. It was empty, void, formless, obscure, hazy. But then he spoke over it. He knew his authority. He spoke things into existence. He spoke shape into existence. The earth wasn't a circle when God looked at it. It wasn't a globe. It literally says it was formless. He spoke the shape of the earth into existence. He spoke the boundaries of the water and the land, of the atmosphere. He spoke it into existence. The vegetations, the animal, the people. He spoke it into existence. Now, I'm not trying to be up here preach a name it and claim it theology because I don't believe in that but I also believe in the verse that Jesus said where he says you can speak to the mountains and they will move this is how we live by faith we look at things that seem empty ineffective we look at things that are hazy and obscure and indefinite and we believe by faith and we speak life into them. And by life, I mean God's word. We live out the life that Genesis 1, 3 said, and God said. Okay, God, this problem seems indefinite, but your word said, but you said. We stand on the promises of God. We stand on the prophecies of God. We stand on the word of God. Okay, Lord, things are a bit hazy in my life right now. But you said that before you formed me in, your, in, in my mother's womb, you knew the plans that you had for me. Okay, God, things seem like they're going to be indefinite. But Lord, you even know how many uh, pieces of sand are on, this, on the sand, uh, are on the seashore. And you know how many hairs are on my head. <coughs> we speak the word into the void and formless and empty parts of our life. That's how we live by faith. We look at situations, we look at our mountains, and we speak to them that they will move. And we speak the promises of God in them. Speak into your indefinite, obscure, hazy, empty things. And speak the word of God over them. I've come to realize that in my life, so often I report, <laughs> complain, right? I report what's going on in my life. I talk about my frustrations. I talk about the things I don't like. I talk about, I give a report of what's going on instead of speaking what God says about it. Instead of speaking God's word over it. So my challenge for myself this week is like, to when I come to the place where I want to report how things are going, I'm going to speak God's word over it instead. So here's the takeaway for us today. 
I want to go through Hebrews 11, and I want to learn faith along with you all and move through this journey together. So here's the takeaway for me this morning, and maybe you can grab onto one of these. I want to remember that what God has for me in the future might not be what is visible today. That the end result is going to look different than it does today. And that's what I want to have confidence in. That's what I want to have hope for. That my life, my ministry, my family, my job, my friends, whatever else is going on around me, that the way it looks today isn't going to be the way it looks at the end. I'm going to realize that even though things might be formless and void in my life, that I can speak to it by faith, God's word, and have assurance that God will create what I need in the future. I want to realize that what God creates, he doesn't create from what I can see today. He creates it by faith. When I hope for things that I can't see, when I have assurance of things that I cannot see, that just like God created the earth from something that wasn't visible, he can create so much more in my life from something that I cannot see today. So bring it, like bring it home, bring it in, into your own life. Let's take a moment to just ponder this and then I'll pray. But what's been frustrating you lately that seems formless and void? What is hazy, unclear, indefinite? What seems empty that you need to speak to by faith? Maybe God's going to show you a few things. You can make it a point to speak God's word into them. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would give us wisdom in what to say to the things that seem formless, the things that seem empty, the things that seem hazy and obscure. Give us words. I pray right now that this room would be filled with faith and it would be filled with the Word of God. Lord, I pray that this week we would be in our Bible looking for ammunition, looking for the words of God to speak into those formless, empty, void places in our life. And Lord, fill us with faith to have confidence and assurance in something that might not be visible today. To, know, to have the faith to know that you, you are there in the end. You were there in the beginning, and you're there at the end. Help us to walk like these heroes of the faith we read about in Hebrews. That we have confidence, assurance in what we hope for, and things that we do not see. In Jesus' name. Amen. Any help you can give to get this place put back would be great.